Um, my name's Al Escobedo. Uh, uh, I'm with Bowman Geothermal. We're an engineering design firm that specializes in geothermal systems, both geothermal heat pump systems, which we'll be talking about today, and geothermal power plant systems as well. A um, little back, background on myself. Uh, I graduated uh, from UCLA with a chemical engineering degree, which probably would have made me a pretty good winemaker. Uh, but I kind of fell into the environmental space, the sustainability gig. Um, and ended up working with uh, geothermal systems. Uh, I've been on both the contractor side, where we did installations of the systems, and now I'm working for an engineering firm, so I regularly do uh, energy modeling. <laughs> now I do energy modeling for facilities and ground loop design. Um, a little messing around with the MEP work inside the facility as well. <coughs> with that, let's, uh, let's get the presentation started. Um, so today I'm just gonna I'm gonna cover the basics of geothermal, uh, what they are, how they work, where they can be applied, a uh, little bit on applications and wineries. I'll go over some financial aspects uh, concerning the the design and the installations of the systems, and then we'll kind of look at a couple case studies. Uh, and. I much prefer an open discussion rather than me just lecturing to you guys. So at any time you have a question or comment or you know more than I do, please uh, let me know and we'll kind of talk through. Uh, so what's in the name? Uh, you know, I refer to these systems as geothermal heat pump systems. Uh, my company's name is Bowman Geothermal. We work, for geoth we work on geothermal power plants, so I like the, the name geothermal. Um, but there's a variety of names out there, ground source heat pump systems, earth coupled heat pump, uh, pump systems, water source heat pumps, geo exchange, geothermal heating and cooling. So if you're ever talking uh, with anybody and they call it by one of these uh, uh, names, it's still the same same thing. Um, ASHRAE, uh, I, I don't know if you all are familiar with ASHRAE, but they create a lot of standards for HVAC and refrigeration systems. I think they use ground source heat pump systems. So you'll find uh, that name a lot in the literature out there for, for this. Um, so what is a geothermal system? Uh, basically, it's a heating and cooling system that uses the earth as a heat sink or heat source. Um, that's it in, in simplest terms. And for right now, I don't want to go beyond that. Uh, OK, so traditional HVAC systems, um, they'll take the warm air from a room uh, push it through across some cooling coils and throw the air back in the, the cool air back in the room and reject the heat to the outside. Or if you're doing a heating process, you'll be using uh, some sort of combustion process unless you have uh, electric resistance heating. Um, geothermal systems though use the constant uh, ground temperature as the heat sink or heat source. Um, this uh, schematic or diagram uh, I believe is the, of the Virginia area, but it kind of gives you a rough idea of what uh, ground temperatures will be like at certain depths. You can see towards the surface, there's still a wide var variance in temperature amongst the seasons. You have January way over here in the 40 degree range, and you have July, you know, closer to the 80 degree range. But as, as you go down the depth to about 30 or 40 feet, that temperature begins to be constant and it's moderate. Uh, in this case, it's around 60 degrees, uh, and that'll be the temperature you're working with. So the traditional systems, you're working with ambient air temperatures, so, you know, hot, uh, hot highs for summer times in 80s and 90s, you're trying to reject heat into that hot temperature. Or uh, cold days where you're, you're looking at 40 degrees, 30 degrees, you're trying to get heat from that cold temperature to either heat or cool process or facility. Um, you were speaking on Oregon. Uh, this is um, uh, various temperatures across the U.S. of ground temperatures at depths between 30 and 60 feet. Uh, you know, ranges between about 40 and 70 degrees throughout the U.S. Here in Oregon, you're probably looking around, oh, I'd say 54, 55 in some locations, depending on groundwater activity and other such activity, maybe a little higher at 60, uh, and even some locations, Oregon's been known to have uh, actual hot rock or geyser potential for high temperature geothermal systems, so 
that area is going to have a lot higher temperatures uh, in the ground. It has some low temperature points too. Not they're not real common, but where you get ice cave effect kind of stuff. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But in general, you can probably estimate your ground temperature to be around 55 degrees around here. So the way geothermal systems work is they take the heat um, from the ground and they push it into the building during a heating mode. And they take the heat from the building and push it into the ground during cooling mode. Now the slides say summer and winter. Uh, I don't like that because that kind of holds it to one specific um, uh, uh, season. That's not true, like I mentioned earlier. You know, uh, a lot of buildings will be either cooling dominant or heating dominant. Uh, so the slide should probably read heating mode and cooling mode. Um, and then the geothermal system will have a series of underground piping. This shows a vertical uh, ground loop system because those are most uh, common. I'd say about 78% of all systems installed are going to be vertical closed loop systems. Um, <coughs> so we'll, uh, pump water through these pipes, let natural heat transfer occur with the ground, bring it back up to the heat pump. The heat pump works on a vapor compression refrigeration cycle and will either heat or cool the building depending on wh whether it's working in forward or reverse uh, uh, refrigeration processes. Do you think Oregon has the potential for lateral based systems? Versus vertical or horizontal based systems? Horizontal, a absolutely. Uh, I, I'm gonna, there's a slide, uh, a couple uh, slides down, that shows all the installation methods. Mm -hmm. And I'll go through each one and, and give you a brief pro and con uh, mm -hmm. for each one. But, or, or I'd say any place, um, there's the horizontal ground loop potential. Uh, it all depends on certain uh, uh, variables. Do you have enough land space? Um, you know, if you're in uh, colder uh, climates like North Dakota, uh, you know, you're going to have to add glycol to your working fluid. Uh, you know, does it make sense? W will it will it still save you money in the long run because adding that glycol uh, increases the, the pumping requirements? Uh, so that's going to uh, bring extra expenses to you. So, um, you know, I think a real critical question around that is what that ground temperature is down. You know, because yeah. You're showing us Virginia. Uh, I believe that the variance is much, much less in Oregon. We so probably have one of the, the most horizontal systems constant. are actually, yeah. We the more stable the your ground temperature, the better horizontal the country right, right here. Well, I, I'd say the temperature is still going to fluctuate, but uh, yeah, you, right. when, you, when you, you're talking with your engineer or a designer, um, they're just going to What's going to happen is you're going to add additional feet of looping depending on how much your temperature uh, varies. Um, you know, for vertical, yeah, for, for vertical ground loop systems, that has the least amount of piping involved. For horizontal loop systems, you know, you could talk anywhere from 1,000 feet of piping to 3,000 feet of piping for a one ton capacity of, of cooling or heating. Uh, so depending on the ground temperatures in that certain climate area, uh, you know, that amount of feet per ton is going to vary. Uh, and that's something that your engineer or whoever you work with will, will kind of determine for you. But it's well, interesting to me, even on your ground temperature map, map where your lines cross, you could actually try to pinpoint a, temp uh, a footage, like on that one is eight feet or whatever, where you're achieving the same temperature actually at eight feet, theoretically, over average time in Oregon because of the average climate. Right. And so, because in my case I have the ability to install something, but I can only dig so deep with like that's, trencher. That's what we you are know, And so it's like, well, well he, I could drill and maybe that is better, but also if I have the ability to trench, then that's probably more economical for me. And he, absolutely. He actually brought it up. He, you, they were think, they're thinking about doing it at three feet. And I, I'm telling him that that's perfectly plausible. Um, you're just going to have to have more area and you'll probably have to add more so, piping. Well, or you we can should talk about... Yeah you know, uh, trenchers that you can rent. I mean, you can rent, I just put in irrigation the other day, and, you know, you can rent just one of those standard ditch witches, and I believe they'll go down to three feet. Four. And that's really cheap. <laughs> so, um, so using the earth, I'm sorry, 
I lost my, my spot here. Sorry. So, <laughs> no problem. So using the earth as a, a heat sink or heat source, uh, you end up with these efficiencies uh, 400 to 600% efficient. Um, I, I've actually spoken to some engineers who have designed their systems where uh, at certain seasons throughout the year, those systems actually reach up to 700 to 750% efficient. It's not constant, but in the right, uh, with the right variables, right climates, uh, right temperatures going on, uh, efficiencies can reach that high as well. Um, and, and you know, as an engineer, when I first uh, heard about this uh, 400, 600 percent efficiency, I was like, yeah, "You're crazy! You can't get anything more than 10 percent." Um, if that's in your mind at all, just think of it this way: you know, electricity, mechanical energy, all that's useful energy. You can do multiple things with that. Heat and cooling, all you can do is heat and cool. So it's a lower form of energy. You're pulling one, one kilowatt hour off the grid and you're getting four to six of heat or cooling into your building. Here's a couple just, um, you know, estimated annual savings. Uh, this is a project in Maryland and one in New York, community college and a federal building. Uh, they both average about, you know, a third uh, uh, savings in their energy costs after the systems were installed. Now the different installation methods. Uh, you have open loop systems uh, like standing column wells or um, an extraction and recharge well. Uh, those systems are pretty good if uh, you can cut through the red tape with uh, regulations because uh, you know you're, you're, you're drilling a water well, you're taking water out of one well, the extraction well, and then you're dumping water back in. Uh, taking the water out is not a problem. Pushing it back in could, could uh, raise some flags. Um, but the systems, you know, one well could produce seven to 20 tons of, of cooling. Um, we actually did a project where geothermal was unfeasible using the vertical closed loop systems. Uh, we went in, we designed it with standing column wells. Uh, the cost got cut by, I think, I think that the total cost after using standing column well was about 20 or 30 percent of the original estimated cost, so the project became feasible. So they're great uh, systems to, to use that way. Um, there are a couple things that you have to look out for. Uh, the type of water quality that you're getting could, could cause uh, scaling on your heat pumps, um, and then of course uh, your regulations. Um, Oregon, I, have, I can imagine, has some pretty tight state regulations concerning uh, wells. Um, I haven't actually looked into it, uh, but I, I would assume so. Uh, and then you have your closed loop systems, uh, pond loops, horizontals, uh, verticals, uh, energy piles. Energy piles aren't, uh, aren't very popular. They're not, they don't happen too often, so I'll kind of skip over that. Um, so Obviously, you guys are familiar with the horizontal loop systems because that's what you're, you're thinking about installing. So, so this, as I think about that pond loop, that's a closed system. <clears throat> so if you have a pond, is that a pretty inexpensive way to do it? We're thinking of putting a pond in anyway. Absolutely. Um, and if you make a man-made pond, which is mm -hmm. possible. Uh, yeah, can, that's you, what it would be. Yeah, you can use it for that, uh, that as well. Uh, you know, it, it'll, it may even cost you less than the horizontal system. Uh, it, it's, it's all going to depend on uh, the, the, the materials needed, uh, the size of your ponds, uh, the amount of uh, piping you'll need, uh, who, out, who out there is available that can do the kind of insulation you need. Uh, there, there's a, a whole string of variables that you need to take a look at. But the pond loop and horizontal loops are both uh, a lot less expensive to install than the vertical closed loop system. Um, how deep does the pond have to be? Uh, I'd say about 30 to 40 feet. Yeah, um, that, would be, that wouldn't work. Um, so we're looking at probably about 14 feet. But there have been systems that have installed uh, at a, le a lot less depth. The <laughs> now, the, the, the problem with horizontal loops is you need a lot more piping. Uh, there are going to be fluctuations in the ground at low depths, like I mentioned before. Uh, and then you know there's a possibility you're going to install this this um, this ground loop uh, over a, a, a quite sizable amount of land, and you know who's to say what you're going to do with some of those areas in the future, 
you can go in if you're, if you're only going to put uh, it in at three feet you know five years down the line you may go in and start driving a fence into the ground or I don't, I don't know some other sort of structure and uh, you hit the pipe and all of a sudden you have a problem with your system so the, the, those things to, to think about when you're installing those you're pretty safe at three feet but um, but they're good system they, they cost a lot less than the vertical closed loop so it's something mm -hmm. that definitely consider vertical closed loop systems their efficiencies are much higher because they don't have to deal with any fluctuation in temperature um, a lot less materials involved uh, as far as piping goes uh, least amount of piping used for a vertical closed loop system uh, the problem with those is you know to find the drillers, uh, the folks that know how to do loop insertion and the grouting and the horizontal trench work. Uh, the industry is so scattered, it's, it's hard to find somebody that's well qualified to do it and cheap at the same time. Uh, so things to keep in mind when you're, you're looking at these. Explain the energy piles, what are those? Uh, you know, I haven't worked with the energy piles, uh, but Basically, it's when you don't have enough load capacity for a building, they'll put these energy files in. Um, I, 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 I'll, I'll get you, I don't want to go, they're, they're so infrequently used, but I'll, I have a, a good um, study on them that I can uh, email to you. If you are, aren't they through. just where you, you put your tubing in a concrete pile? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. So, you know you have to sometimes put pilings in for buildings? Right. If you run coils of tubing in your big massive concrete pile then the concrete will distribute the heat out of the building that's all you didn't have okay to that's yeah. <laughs> sorry okay. Uh, okay and then you have your mechanical system considerations as well um, uh, you have central plant systems where you'll have uh, you know your hydronic piping running through the building and uh, you'll have a uh, central plant uh, where Let's see, your, um, your cold line will go through a condenser to the evaporator, go through another hot, uh, I wish I had the diagram. Anyways, you, you basically have your heat pump or, or, or a chiller, normally it's a chiller boiler uh, central plant system for, for larger buildings and we'll, we'll stream off a, a hot water pipe and cold water pipe throughout the building. Uh, to reach any uh, equipment that you have in the building to, to heat and cool different zones or processes throughout that building. Uh, in this case, you would use the, the heat pumps and the, the uh, bore field uh, in your central pipe, um, in your central plant. Uh, distributed systems, uh, what you do is you have your, your ground loop, um, will be connected to a, a manifold or a vault, and uh, you'll have piping go to going into the separate water source heat pumps uh, situated throughout the building. Uh, and then you have your hybrid options, uh, which I'll get into in a few uh, minutes. Uh, but basically, when you have a cooling dominant load, what you'll do is you'll use a fluid cooler to either cool the bore field um, or uh, during, during a nighttime pre-cooling, or you'll use it to um, ramp up during peak hours, peak loads. Uh, to cover any excess uh, heating or cooling load that you may uh, occur during those times. And then, you know, new constructions and, and renovations. Um, you're doing a new construction, which is uh, optimal for when, when you're looking at the financials for geothermal heat pump systems. Um, retrofits, you want to have the right uh, criteria If, if your current mechanical systems or refrigeration systems are relatively new equipment, you're not going to want to throw that equipment out and bring in a heat pump system. That would just make no financial sense whatsoever. But if it's going towards the end of its life, uh, geothermal heat pump systems are a good thing to consider. Uh, another consideration that you may want to look at is if you're doing a retrofit project, you keep your current equipment, whether it be chillers or uh, evaporated evaporative coolers and you tie those pieces of equipment directly into a bore field um, and then eventually as those pieces of equipment get to the end of their life then you bring in your heat pumps and you kind of change the design of the system that way. 
hybrid systems. Um, like I said, the 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 optimal conditions is when you have balanced heating and cooling loads. Uh, this is why back east, where they have uh, seasons, you actually have winters and summers and falls and springs. Uh, these systems are very popular because they have balanced loads throughout the year. Uh, but when you have buildings that are cooling dominant or heating dominant, uh, you're either continuously dumping heat into the ground or continuously pulling heat out of the ground. And over time, that will cause a change in the ground temperature. It'll, it'll either raise it by, uh, you know, 10 degrees, 15 degrees over 20 years, or it'll lower it by 10 to 15 degrees uh, over 20 years. Um, maybe even even less, maybe over five or 10 years. Uh, that changes the efficiencies of the system, um, and it's not something uh, that you want to have happen because it kind of nullifies why you put these systems in in the first place to save energy uh, and to save operating costs so um, as we think about a winery and I'm thinking about ours in particular our winery is going to be built into the ground and then it's going to be insulated concrete forms uh, poly steel all the way around so it's going to be very naturally energy efficient and in fact I think, Greg, um, you know, if you build a big warehouse and you don't, don't heat or cool it, it tends to hang around, even in the summertime, uh, no higher than the, the low 60s. Is that fairly fairly accurate? Oh, oh, I mean, if you just leave it sealed up and let the sun hit it day after day and, and you don't even bring air in at night or anything, you'll get high, higher temperatures than that. But you're not talking about it going up to 90. Yeah, like it's so it's going to be relatively, relatively heat efficient. Stable. And given that, given that it does cool down at night, if you open it up at night and cool it down like that, I think you can keep it. You can keep the the air conditioning down to a fairly low level. The time you're going to ha be using the cooling quite a bit is probably right during, or some years right during harvest. You know when you're you've got the fermenters in it and everything if you've got a warm year or something like that and then probably toward August and so on you're going to be you're going to be looking at at um, uh, doing a lot of cooling but you know for most of the year you're going to you're, you're not going to be running the cooling a lot so I would guess that. Do you agree with that? Or no? I've seen this year we're cooling and irrigating in May. <laughs> yeah. Today. But yeah. your your building your building is <laughs> is not built down into the ground and and um, you know it's it's it doesn't. What type uh, of construction is it? It's a steel it's building. Oh yeah. So it has. Yeah. So, it has no yeah, so you wouldn't be you wouldn't yeah, not be cooling the building at this point in time. You know, with, with the with the type of building that we're looking at, you would when it's like ninety five degrees and stuff. The the building will not really, I mean, really need heating or cooling other than, um, I mean, if you're just talking about being able to work in it and not caring if there's a 10 degree temperature change. Well, you want to know. No, I know. But you're, you're talking about space heating or cooling. Right. Not, not actual for any processes or right. cold storage but, or anything. But like so the, the cooling load is cooling off for the fermenters, cooling off yeah. for any heat load that you put in it for the yeah. industrial process. Okay. Yeah. And, but then you got to remember the heat load is you're probably going to pressure wash the thing out with hot water. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm going to get into that. And so that he might well. be actually fairly balanced. Yeah. Um, hybrid Sorry. systems, uh, great front balance loads. It reduces the bore field size and obviously the overall insulation cost since you don't have to pay so much, uh, have uh, as much piping in the bore fields. Uh, it accommodates for nighttime pre cooling, which takes advantage of uh, uh, off peak uh, nighttime utility rates. Um, and a lot of the times makes uh, otherwise unfeasible projects uh, able to, to look economically sound for, for uh, folks that, that are going to install it. Uh, and it's still, uh, the, the, the the, it still produces significant energy savings. Uh, the difference between a 100% geothermal heat pump system and a hybrid system as far as energy savings go isn't going to be that uh, much of a uh, deal. Uh, hybrid example. Um, you know, this is Washington, D.C. again. Uh, we actually just did this um, uh, study for, for this uh, particular facility. Uh, their peak loads, uh, obviously the cooling is twice as much as the heating is. You can see uh, the year-round uh, temperature energy profile 
Uh, cooling is obviously dominant in this uh, area. Um, this is points I've already made. Uh, you know, a much larger uh, heat rejection is going to end up in long-term heating of the ground. Um, alternately, you use a loop cooler to cool the field um, and balance those loads. And that <coughs> that loop cooler doesn't need to be going constantly. It can ramp up uh, when it's needed and shut off when it's when it's not. And um, you know, th this basically shows you. The blue line is where we use 20 wells without a, uh, a loop cooler. The red line is is where we actually use uh, the hybrid system with only 10 wells. So the bore, <laughs> the bore field's half the size, so the installation's going to be uh, a little bit more than half the cost. Um, but over time, you'll notice that with 20 wells, no loop cooler, the the temperature of the bore field begins to raise the entering water temperature to the condenser uh, begins to raise, which lowers the efficiencies, especially since your maximum entering water temperature should be uh, 95 degrees or less in this case. Um, so it makes, it makes a lot of sense for cooling dominant uh, facilities. And, I, and I, I, I mention hybrid now because that's what wineries are, they're cooling dominant. So it's something to consider when you're doing your uh, design process or considering these systems. So is the cooling tower like a swamp mm -hmm. cooler? Does it drip water on it? Yeah, I mean, it can be an evaporative cooler okay. or a chiller. Uh, okay. uh, when and where can geothermal heat pump systems be used? Um, they can be used pretty much anywhere. In the US, around the world, uh, it's plausible to install them and have them uh, work anywhere. It's going to be better in some locations. Uh, I'll, I'll get into some, some key criteria that'll make uh, certain projects more feasible than others. Uh, but technically, they can work at any location. Um, and they can work for any building, uh, from residential buildings to industrial buildings, commercial buildings, uh, so on and so forth. Um, two, of the main key, two of the main considerations is economic feasibility. Um, you know, if, if it's going to cost you an arm and a leg to install the system, and the, the savings you get from operations uh, isn't high enough, obviously it's not going to be worth uh, installing geothermal systems to whoever's thinking about it. There are plenty of other technologies that can save you energy out there. Um, I believe this is a, an excellent one. It's just not going to be economically feasible at every location. Um, and then land available, avail availability. Uh, you're not going to put it in uh, in an urban setting for a high-rise uh, structure that requires, you know, a thousand ton plus cooling load. It's just not, there's not going to be enough land, but uh, enough bore field in uh, to cover those, that capacity. Uh, now key criteria, uh, balance loads would be great. Obviously you have hybrid options or you increase the size of the bore field to cover that uh, aspects. Uh, high occupancy and building operations. Buildings that have 24 hours, seven day use are going to experience uh, the value of geothermal systems a lot more than I'll oh, say a public library that's open five days a week eight hours a day um, uh, buildings with hot water demand is great you know you get free hot water uh, during cooling modes you, you transfer the heat that you take out of uh, whatever process or space that you're, you're cooling and you throw that heat into your hot water demand and you get free uh, free hot water through that uh, process um, Places with high utility rates, I don't believe it's they're high around here, maybe an average of 10 cents a kilowatt hour and a uh, dollar a therm. Yeah, that's, that's about right. right. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're moderate, so you can still uh, see pretty good uh, operation savings with, with those kinds of rates. And like I mentioned, uh, land availability as well. Where, where these are educational institutes, uh, it's kind of to the point of where they can be used. Uh, Ball State University, that's a whole campus. You were talking about multiple buildings. That's a whole campus installation. All 50 buildings are tied into one geothermal heat pump system. Um, here's uh, a, a downtown campus in U Eugene, Oregon. Uh, commercial buildings, ASHRAE headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, they use it. Uh, first successful commercial installation was actually in Portland uh, back in 1946. So that's kind of the store, pretty cool. I thought that was pretty cool for this, this presentation. <laughs> cool. We appreciate it. <laughs> uh, hospitality. Um, 
hotels, lodging, great applications, 24-hour use, lots of hot water demands for laundry or uh, uh, domestic hot water use for separate hotel rooms and showers and such. Um, and then wineries, uh, great application. And I, I chose these three because you know you have one all the way back on the East Coast, you have one in Texas, and then here in Oregon, uh, the Vine and Wine Center. Uh, I actually just found out about that one a couple weeks ago when I was trying to email and call folks around the area for this. Um, so applied to wineries, uh, you know, you guys can probably teach me a little bit more about the processes in, in the wineries. Um, this is basic. Uh, the basic steps, I guess. Uh, but the point of this slide is, you know, typically around 40 to 60 percent of all electricity in wineries is spent um, on refrigeration or cooling, either process or space uh, cooling. Um, doesn't matter uh, what winery you are. Every winery is going to have different uh, fermentation pro uh, processes depending on the, the varietals you use and the wine you're producing, uh, the type of equipment you've chosen for your winery. The, the processes are all going to be a little bit different, but it's going to remain the same. That uh, electricity is going to be around 40 to 60 percent of all electricity consumption for for uh, cooling uh, for cooling reasons. Uh, <coughs> at the same time, a winery is using a significant amount of hot water. Mm -hmm. I think you were mentioning it before. You're going to want to spray down uh, the process tanks or the production room, uh, barrel washing, uh, whatever your uh, Sanitation requirements are, or equipment that you use, you, you regularly use hot water, um, and, and, a, and a significant amount of it. So, uh, refrigeration and cooling processes: must cooling, juice clarification, fermentation, cold stabilization, wine storage, and space cooling. Um, now, some of these processes, uh, cold stabilization, I think you need temperatures as low as 20, 20 to 30 degrees. Uh, Fahrenheit. That's kind of my question, even when we're the hot water in, I mean, we're dealing with such extreme I mean, sanitation starts at 180 up to steam as far as the hot end goes. Right. Can we get there? And as far as cold stability goes, I mean, we want to be running, you know, at the, the source itself, 15, 18 degrees Fahrenheit. And it, it, it's perfectly possible to use geothermal heat pump systems in those applications. Uh -huh. You all, will have some sort of auxiliary equipment or some uh, schematic of equipment that will get you to those temperatures, but you can apply them in, kind of in a hybrid situation uh, where you're using additional equipment where geothermal heat pump systems will start you off in the right direction and you'll get the energy savings for you know most of that process, but then you'll use whatever auxiliary equipment is necessary to get you to that yeah. other temperature. Now there is uh, one of my case studies. Um, they use the systems to supply, to supply uh, three different temperatures of water, and one of them, one of the temperatures is as low as 20, which will be good for for your your coldest uh, process, uh, from what I've read. Um, so, hot, hot but you're obviously not using water. Glycol, I think, is what he means. You go to a glycol. You, yeah, you yeah. Well, actually, I think they use just water, um, but you can use not at glycol. 20 degrees. You can use uh, the glycol solution, but keep in mind when you use glycol solutions, your pumping requirements increase. Right. So that may right. that may take that uh, additional requirement may, may cost you more in the long run, uh, in operation wise. Um, Why is that? He, here's here's to your point again. More resistant. Uh, the the density, uh, the weight uh, of the glycol solution. So, yeah. <coughs> Something it, it, like it's, that. It, it, requires more pumping. It that takes a lot more expensive too. Because yeah. there's environmental yeah. Yeah. side Requ effects possible. Yeah. The viscosity okay. of it, whereas the pumps out faster. There's a flow but you so have in, in, in actually colder weather, uh, they, they say to use glycol. Uh, I, I always struck around with a, a buddy. Um, it costs more to buy the solution, uh, the glycol solution for your, your ground loops than it would to just buy a backup generator. And the whole purpose in colder weather of having glycol so the, the pipes don't freeze. But if you just but buy a cheap generator, I, I think pop we're it talking about two different things. Yeah, I, I don't think we're we're saying to put glycol. There's no need to put glycol in the ground. loop that goes in through the ground. No, no. Well, we're no. talking about glycol. glycol well, no, I mean, is in the winery, there is because that's what you're using to chill your tanks right, yeah, or exactly, clear building yeah. and a lot of supplemental. Right. 
in so, system. So that's what he was talking about is how to tie those right together. Yeah, exactly. That that's that's what I. So you can you can use this um, to you can use the the uh, ground loop to cool your glycol for your interior of your winery. Yes, right? yes. Uh, you'll have some sort of heat exchange like, like right. the, the your fermentation tanks. They have sure. a jacket around it yeah. where you have a glycol that goes yeah. through to yeah. cool them down. Mm -hmm. uh, those that, that solution comes out and has some sort of heat exchange process probably with a chiller. Mm -hmm. um, instead of the chiller, you'll use a heat pump and that heat pump will be connected to a bore field. Yeah. Uh, and you'll have it in the right um, the lineup or schematic yeah. to, to get to the temperatures that you need. Yeah. yeah. So what I could see here is, you know, kind of three different pieces of this. You'd have water to water for your um, uh, space, heating and cooling. You'd have water to glycol for your glycol system through your, through your winery. And then you'd also have water to water for your hot water use in your winery. And you could do all three of those off this system, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. And to your point, the hot water demands, um, you guys need uh, 180 degree Fahrenheit water uh, for any kind of uh, washing or sanitation process. Uh, you can actually use less temperatures, but then you have to do it for a longer time, which will create more water. And then you have to worry about where do I take that water, uh, that wastewater. Um, Geothermal heat pump systems, they can, they can raise water to 125 degrees without any problem. All that's going to be free energy. So if you start off at 60 degrees and you raise it up, you know, 65 degrees, that's all free uh, when you're in cooling mode. Um, it can even go up to uh, 140, 150 degree Fahrenheit water. Um, but that's going to compromise the efficiency of the system. So you will have to have some sort of supplemental uh, equipment, some sort of auxiliary equipment to supplement the excess uh, heat that you'll need to create the temperatures that you need. Um, but in the long run, it's still going to be more cost effective. Uh, it's still going to save you a lot of energy um, in, in your operations uh, than well, it would if you just had right. a traditional and your system. heating equipment gets smaller because of that. Like if you take an inline tank, you know, uh, if you have a 70 or 100 or 130 degree temperature rise, you have this big massive inline tank to handle even two gallons per minute. Right. But if you've got a 30 degree temperature rise or 40 degree temperature rise, that exact same inline unit will handle 15 gallons per minute. Exactly. And so, you know, you can have a very, very small little, you know, inline tank to kick that water temperature. Uh, geothermal heat pump systems are closed loop, so we talked about aggregating loads. Mm -hmm. You know, you can take heat from one area and put it into another. Um, and then they're, they're also capable of using uh, radiant uh, heating and cooling. So you, you put your, your piping in the floors and it'll radiate heat through it. Uh, great for production rooms where you're spraying all that water down to evaporate, make sure it's nice and dry, safe for whoever's working there. Um, also, uh, you know, for your, your restaurants or tasting rooms will have your radiant uh, flooring for larger size buildings, I wouldn't recommend it, but for smaller size uh, areas, it's a, it's a great way to, to space heat and cool. Um, now this, this is uh, uh, Northern California wineries. This is something I found. Um, it, it was, uh, I think 50 or 60 wineries um, gave their annual electricity use. Um, I have this here to kind of, this is the best fit uh, trend line. You know, some, some wineries were up here at this, this level and some were down here at this level, but this is uh, the best fit uh, uh, trend line. Um, say you produce 20,000 cases a year, you're looking at 280,000 kilowatt hours in electricity. Uh, 40 to 60% of that, let's just say 50% of that is based on refrigeration and cooling. Uh, so you're looking at 140,000 kilowatt hours strictly for refrigeration and cooling processes. Geothermal, even if it were to take, oh, uh, let's do 40%, uh, you're still looking at um, 63,000 kilowatt hours saved each year, or at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, about 6,000 a year in savings. So it's uh, 
it's definitely something to consider. I mean, your winery could use a lot more electricity than this. Your winery could use a lot less electricity than this. This is just the best uh, fit line that I found. And kind of an example of, you know, what you could expect. Uh, water use. Um, it's a lot of wording on this. Uh, ba basically, um, this slide, you know, for every gallon of wine you produce, you're gonna use, I, I don't know, anywhere from two to 20 gallons of water, depending on your, your processes, depending on what, what setup you have. Uh, I think a conservative amount's three gallons or less, uh, rule of thumb's about six. If you're just not uh, conserving water, you're wasting, you know, 15 to 20 gallons per, per gallon of wine. Uh, but 70% of that is gonna be uh, for cleaning. And out of that 70%, 95% of it's gonna be hot water demand. Uh, and if you did a conservative estimate, three gallons of water per gallon of wine, for 20,000 uh, cases a year, you're, you're looking at 72,000 to 201,000 uh, kilo BTUs per year for hot water, simply for hot water. Um, now, as I mentioned, geothermal heat pump systems, you're still going to need some of that energy to get to the temperatures you'll need. But if it could just cut half of that, that's a tremendous savings of energy. So, something, something to consider when you're looking at these systems. Financial considerations. Um, ground loop design. Mechanical design and all alternative considerations. Um, it's not going to be a major portion uh, portion of your, your budget when in implementing these systems, uh, but extra costs in this area is going to save you a lot in this area, and this these costs are a lot more than those. Um, if you're thinking about doing vertical closed loop installations, you're going to probably want to think about doing a thermal conductivity test. Uh, it allows your, your designer engineer to get the thermal conductivity to the ground, uh, the borehole resistivity, the thermal diffusivity, and, and the, the undisturbed uh, formation temperature. Um, all key and in, in instrumental when doing ground loop design. Um, but that test alone could run you, you know, $12,000. Uh, other ways to do it is have an experienced uh, engineer or soil scientist estimate um, from whatever data there is out there what your ground temperatures will look like um, and what your, your thermal uh, conductivity is going to look like. Um, but that could cause, you know, a good extra 10 to 20 percent in length of your bore field. And that could rise the cost uh, quite lengthy. Um, so if you're doing a larger installation, I always suggest do a thermal conductivity test. If you're doing a smaller installation, uh, an estimate from a, an experienced uh, engineer or scientist is, is a decent way to go. Yeah. When you do a horizontal loop system, are they're typically just using packs. Right. <coughs> horizontal, yeah. Absolutely. Um, mechanical design, uh, you know, you have to look at, are you going to keep uh, your current equipment and use that alongside the geothermal equipment? Are you going to replace everything with just uh, the, the heat pumps? Um, are, are you doing a retrofit project where all your equipment's old and you're getting new equipment in? Uh, or are you doing a construction where you, where you can start from scratch? Which is usually the best, uh, mm -hmm. best scenario. Uh, and then your alternative uh, considerations, hybrid systems will reduce the, the capital costs of the project. Um, you won't receive as much uh, in operation savings, but uh, it, not, not a significant amount less than if you were to do 100% um, geothermal. And then system integration. Do you already have conservative measures? Do you already have a solar array at your, your place that you want to tie the geothermal system into? Um, do you want to conserve water or hot water as well? Um, a, lo a lot of considerations can save you money in the long run. Uh, so it's, it's always good to put money up front into this side of the equation uh, so you're spending a lot less on this side. Um, now I put the, the installation uh, as a vertical closed loop for financial considerations because that's about 78% of all installations in the U.S. You guys are talking horizontal, so uh, it's going to be a little bit uh, different. Um, 
you're trenching the equipments regularly. Uh, it's, it's easily accessible in any area that you're at. Uh, pretty cheap to do uh, horizontal insulation. Um, uh, it is labor intensive and uh, you know you can obviously go out and do it yourself if you know how to run the equipment though. Um, I knew a guy in Arizona who's putting it in his house. He was a, a retired engineer. He designed the system. He, he rented the equipment. And he went out and dug his He's ditches. Still riding on the <laughs> 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 and, and he did it himself. If, just, yeah, if you're able to do that, more power to you. <laughs> um, we did a half mile in four hours. Well, on horizontal systems, what's your tube spacing typically? Tube spacing? Um, you just ballpark. Five, five to ten feet. It, it depends on what kind of system are you are. I would first suggest you look at the slinky loops. Because uh, you'll be able to get a lot more piping in in a lot less area. The problem is you'll need a lot more piping because there, there, you're not going to have as yeah, much situation. space apart. Uh, we were looking at a project at um, the Smithsonian, and they were looking at a ground temperature raise within the first two years without using a hybrid, hybrid system. So right, but we're still talking uh, annual. We're not talking about in one season. Years. No, so we're talking reverse it though, so your ground temperature raise can be moderated over time. Yeah, in the winter time. Yeah, you're going to be going back and forth. I wonder if I can ans ask a couple questions and then I will leave. Um, uh, do you have any recommendations for local contractors or engineers? Um, well, obviously, I'll recommend my uh, my okay. company for engineering. Uh -huh. um, I'll give you a business card if you'd like. Yeah. Okay. Um, Contractors, uh, we can find it. I mean, first go to your design guys because you're going to want to design the system first. The engineers. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then work with them to find the proper contractor. Sure. Uh, so the installation goes in mm -hmm. well. Very good. And then what about uh, energy rebates, grants, etc.? Do you have information there? Uh, real okay, quick. Real, real quick answer, just go to this website and you'll find all the incentives, federal, state, uh, utility. Uh, here's a list of them that I pulled off this, this site. Um, you can also go to PGE. Uh, that's probably that's your, your local utility provider. Mm -hmm. yeah. Talk with one of their representatives. Um, they, you know, utilities always have custom uh, rebate offers, so you tell them what you're doing. Mm -hmm. They can probably do something beyond this hundred, good, three hundred dollar okay. rebate. Uh, but your your biggest your biggest rebates are going to be your federal tax incentives, ten percent investment tax tax yeah. incentives. Okay. Your uh, depreciation deduction deduction rate mm -hmm. and uh, your your deduction based on energy. The, the USDA may do something for farms too. Go we go got to, one on our one. We go to reap. These are cash rebates uh, or uh, cash grants or loans. Um, very competitive. So as soon as you see the application period come up, and what apply. is REAP? That's REAP what you're is okay, R that's the Rural oh, Energy okay, yeah, America. Yeah. That's the that's the USDA. Yeah. And, and Let I'm me get your card. Send, all of these um, resources are in our resource guide online, yeah. like the Carbon Reduction Challenge, but including Desire USA. And what I've had problems trying to do is, is calculate the load for the building. I can't, you know, I found some, that I'm not sure a, a PhD thermal engineer could have worked through. Uh, is there, is there a more, somewhat of a simpler approach that one can say and feel what my, what my thermal load's going to be on these buildings? Um, uh, you know, you, the simplest approach uh, would to be uh, use the DOE's uh, energy modeling program. Um, uh, the name escapes me at the moment. Um, but you're, you're going to have to look at all the equipment inside the building and figure out your process loads and what kind of uh, uh, thermal loads they're, they're uh, adding to the equation. Um, you know, you're going to have your facility, your building load. Essentially Essentially, these two buildings are empty buildings. You know, one is, is, is case goods and the other one is barrel goods. Okay. There's basically almost nothing else in there. Got a little bit of lighting, some T5 lighting, and uh, that's about it. So you don't, you don't have any, you don't have any uh, tanks or... Uh, no. Okay, okay. Not, yeah. not, not in these buildings. These, like I said, these buildings, 
One is specifically designed as a barrel building, the other one as a as a glass storage building. Okay, what, what's um, what is so, the, the are they are they large facilities? Are, are you talking um, you know hundred thousand square feet, or are you talking about ten thousand square feet? Uh, one is uh, probably twelve, but the other one's probably six. Okay, yeah. Um, um, the DOE has a free energy modeling software. Uh, energy plus. Energy plus. Okay. Energy plus. Thank you. Bob, I brought it up on the screen so that you can okay, see, I see it. it. Yeah. Um, excellent, excellent way to do simple uh, models for heating and cooling loads. Um, you, you'll have to have some um, architectural plans to to put in. Uh, uh, some of the variables in there. Uh, if you don't have it, you can always estimate. Um, they, they usually have pretty good default uh, variables already included in, in their program. But it's a okay. it's a good it's a good place to start. Now I, I just want to warn you: working with these programs, it's always um, uh, the quality of information you get out of them is always based on the knowledge of the per, uh, the knowledge of the person putting in the different variables. Uh, garbage in, garbage out, huh? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, if you have some idea of what the building's like, uh, you should be able to no, get... We, we, we built them, so it's, that's not a problem. Okay, you should be able to get some pretty good information off that then. Yeah. Okay, it's, I just hadn't found that one. Thank you very much. No problem, no problem. Okay, so uh, back to finance. Consider we've kind of covered this. Uh, incentives, here's your federal incentives. Um, like I said, REAP is going to be uh, great if you can manage to get uh, the grants from there. Um, but it's very competitive. A lot of people apply for it uh, on a yearly basis or whenever it comes up. So as soon as you see the applications ready to go, I'd start filling out one. Um, and then your state utility uh, incentives. Uh, you know, they have 35% uh, tax credits, a state rebate, 100 to $300. I think that's on a per ton basis. Um, but this all can be found on this website. Uh, Some the case studies. It's a winery in New York. It's a 20 ton system. Uh, uh, the system heats and cools the, the space in the building and then provides chilled water for the fermentation tanks. Uh, they've calculated savings of 50% using the systems with a payback period of two and a half years. This was a horizontal loop system, the slinky system that I've been mentioning. Um, if they did do vertical closed loop, it'd probably be about a five or six year payback. Uh, would be my assumption. Uh, this place is LEED Gold certified, and uh, you'll notice in a lot of my, the next example as well, they use uh, radiant floor heating uh, for their process rooms and uh, case and barrel storage <coughs> and bottling areas. Here's one in South Dakota, another 20 ton closed loop system. This is the one um, that I had mentioned earlier where they have uh, three separate storage tanks with three separate uh, water temperatures, one at 110, one at 45, and one at 20. Uh, that'll pretty much cover the basis for, I, I would say, any process that you have in the winery except for the 180 degree hot water demand. Um, but that 110 will get you on the right start to your, your hot water needs. Um, this system's used for space heating and the fermentation process as well, uh, as, where, as well as cold storage areas. Also uses radiant floor heating and cooling. Um, they calculate savings of uh, five thousand dollars per year. Only cost of thirty thousand installs, so you're looking at a six-year payback period there. And then a couple other quick studies. Um, here's one in California. That was a vertical loop system, uh, twenty wells at a two hundred fifty foot depth. Uh, expected payback period was you know, six years. And then here's one in Virginia. Uh, this one costs one hundred and eighty thousand dollars to install. That's that's a vertical closed loop system, uh, but they're saving five thousand dollars a month, uh, and their their payback period is five years. So and, uh, five thousand dollars a month, every month. Uh, on on average, some months were three thousand. Well, others, that's sixty thousand a year. That's a three year payback. Oh, that's probably just my my uh, typo. <laughs> that's a typo on my part. Sorry. Okay. And then this is just my normal jargon that I'll skip through. Because uh, one one other thing I, I want to bring up about geothermal heat pumps is, um, you know, you, you guys have 
started to take the initiative of becoming environmental stewards, whether it be starting your winery off, off brand new, uh, using the cave expansion that you're doing to, to help save energy, or starting to think about geothermal systems for your winery. Um, the great thing about geothermal, like the cave or other technologies, unlike wind and solar, it's kind of out of the way. Um, you know, I, I live near the San Inez Valley, so there's a couple wineries I go up to every now and then. It's a great location. I love going up there. The, the ambience is nice. Uh, to put a big wind turbine or solar array kind of takes away from the feel. Uh, these systems, they're, they're underground. They decrease your mechanical space. Uh, and this, they're kind of out of the way. So they're, they're not an eyesore. And uh, a lot of people do um, renewable energy or energy efficiency projects to kind of show off, check out this cool thing that I got over here. Let me show you my sexy solar panels over here. Uh, these are these are kind of unsung heroes because they're just they're, they're nowhere to be seen. So you can't flash them, but you can definitely experience the value. And I just want to add that to the mix.